When former Premier of Manitoba Gary Philman was growing up, anything political was the furthest thing from his mind. His childhood and adolescence were preoccupied with surviving life in the toughest part of Winnipeg. Uh, at the time, of course, it was a uh, very much of a multicultural environment. Almost all my neighbors were uh, from various different ethnic backgrounds, uh, immigrants. Uh, my father had come over from Romania as a as a 18 or 19 year old. Uh, my mother was born here, the only one of, uh, of four children in her family that was born in Canada of Ukrainian parents. And so uh, I lived in an area in which people spoke Ukrainian, Polish, German, Yiddish, all those different uh, languages. And um, it was, uh, I think, in the early days, uh, uh, dirt roads. Uh, certainly we had an outhouse uh, when I was very, very young. Um, we had a uh, heat from basically an old cast iron stove in the kitchen. My mother had a terrible accident and got burned because she used to lean against the stove uh, to warm up in the mornings. Uh, um, it, it was a, an, a very impoverished environment. I didn't feel in any way downtrodden because of it, but at the same time, uh, I certainly didn't grow up uh, with a background of, uh, of any wealth. But he was raised to believe in opportunity. I am um, a lifelong uh, advocate of education as being the source of, of all opportunity in the world uh, because of what I was able to do and what many, many people that I observed uh, in that North End environment who, uh, because of a public education of good quality and the opportunity to go to college or university, uh, people were able to go from the lowest socioeconomic status to the highest in one generation. There's no more powerful force in, in our world. And uh, so that, to me, was uh, the reason that people just said, stay in school you'll do well. Uh, my parents said that, uh, um, people who I respected said that, and so I just kept going through school and uh, as opportunities came, I was a, my parents could not have afforded to uh, send me to university, but um, I was able to get scholarships and bursaries and uh, uh, made my way through engineering, ultimately to a master's degree level because of those opportunities that we have, and it's it's the great beauty of Canada, the great strength of Canada. Gary Philman's hard work and education paid off. And before long, he was a successful owner of two businesses with a wide network of friends collected from the university, from home and school, and from church activities. One day, somebody suggested that he run for Winnipeg City Council. I said, well, um, they say that, you know, I could do this. And, and so Janice said, well, you know, I want you to know a few things, uh, one of which was uh, you have a family, three children at the time, and uh, you, you have a wife, and uh, we came before all of this. So if you decide to go into politics, you know, it can be a very consuming kind of profession. and. Uh, uh, if it takes away too much time, then I'm going to remind you that we came first and that you have uh, obligations to your family first. And I said, no problem. I'm, my family come first and uh, I can do this and it'll just be on the side and everything will be okay. And it was manageable. Then in 1979, he won his first seat in the Manitoba legislature in the riding of River Heights by just 17 votes. And he learned a few essentials about campaigning. And so I worked door to door to door over and over again every time I ran, right up until the time when I became Premier and it became impossible basically uh, to, to go door to door to any extent. And uh, so uh, that was a disappointment for me. Philman asked the leader of his government, Sterling Lyon, for time to get to know the legislature before accepting cabinet responsibilities. 
I was given three different portfolios all at once. I was given uh, consumer and corporate affairs, environment and housing because he had a couple of long-standing uh, members of, uh, of cabinet that he uh, wasn't willing to take out of cabinet but he made them ministers without portfolio and um, I got the lucky uh, opportunity to have three portfolios, three areas combined into one portfolio and it was a very difficult challenge. I spent just all, most of my life reading and reading briefing notes and getting to, to up to speed on issues uh, but yet it was the best learning experience I could ever have imagined. Balancing political life and family life was getting more complicated. But, uh, those were difficult times for, uh, for me on the home front, I'd say. <laughs> this was the era when conservative ideologues like Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan and Brian Mulroney were in power. And Canada's Reform Party was waiting in the wings. But Gary Philman didn't see himself in that camp. I'm an economic conservative. I'm not a social conservative. Uh, and uh, uh, I believed more or less in, in conservatism as a kitchen table kind of issue where, you know, in my own home, in my own business, I knew that I had to balance my budget in order to make ends meet. Uh, I couldn't buy things that I couldn't afford. My father never had a uh, credit card in all his life. Uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. At the very last few years, he used to drive to, to visit his sister in British Columbia, and uh, he took out an ESO credit card so that he didn't have to have all this cash in his pocket driving across the prairies. Uh, but aside from that, uh, I remember him buying, for instance, uh, a fridge and a stove at Eaton's and, and going first to the bank, taking out the cash and going to Eaton's to buy a fridge and a stove. Uh, and that was ingrained in me. Uh, I guess uh, I was a, a child of the Second World War, but still knew all the stories that people told about the dirty 30s and that imprinted right on me. And so I, I believe that people in general at their home level, at their own family level, believe in conservative economics, and that's where I came from. Time spent on the back benches created many positive relationships, and his support there led him to a bid for leadership of Manitoba's Conservative Party in 1983. That meant finding a leadership strategy for his campaign and for his time as Premier. First, stay calm or at least look calm it's like a duck uh, very calm the feathers uh, are very uh, neat and on top of the water but underneath he's paddling like crazy and uh, it was all internal and and uh, you know uh, maybe to some degree that was the case with me maybe i didn't know that i was feeling the stress and i honestly didn't uh, people said to me after i left office you know, you look 10 years younger, what is it? And, uh, you know, maybe it's the lines in your face or, or just uh, the, the sort of the stressful look that you have, but uh, I didn't feel the stress for sure. But I, uh, there's no question that uh, there were many, many times that I must have been under a tremendous amount of stress. And in spite of the pressures of being Premier, he made internal communications a priority. If I got a call at, uh, one o'clock or two o'clock in the afternoon that somebody was wanting to see me and I had a, you know, a whole stack of people waiting in line uh, every half hour I had a new group coming to see me. The last thing that I would do would be to stay and, and uh, see that caucus member before I went home and before they went home. So it was very much of a commitment that I kept in touch with the caucus. Gary Philman's good friend and mentor, Duff Roblin, had warned him about the stress of being on constant public display. You have these scrums, and you have this jam of people around you, and they're all forcing cameras right up against your face so that when people see you on television, your face is distorted, the camera's so close. And he said, uh, it's, and, and he said they can watch a trickle of sweat go down your cheek as you get a little bit uh, nervous about a question that's just been asked and he said that becomes how people make judgments about you he said 
it's so different today, it's night and day. Well, add to that now social media, add to that, you know, what's done by Twitter and, and the instant response that people get. I mean, it's enormously more intrusive and enormously more pressure packed. So um, I don't know about, you know, that in terms of how people react and, and the intensity that people that people's lives are, uh, are lived with which uh, they're lived, uh, uh, it's different today for sure. And it's just, it's almost multiplying, it's steamrolling. So I know how tough I thought it was in my day with the scrums and, and the intensity of, of people around you. Uh, during those Meech Lake days, you know, there were, there were from time to time 10 different camera crews around and, uh, and, and just a jam up of people from right across the country all hanging on every word, but it's worse today. One of the most intense crises Philman faced as Premier of Manitoba was known as the Meech Lake Accord. This was a proposed constitutional amendment which would give Quebec special status in Canadian Confederation and guarantee its place in Canada. Canadians were instructed that the country would collapse if the accord wasn't passed. Only two premiers publicly resisted the accord, Newfoundland's Clyde Wells and Manitoba's Gary Philman. Philman, along with other Manitoba politicians, thought the accord was mistakenly based on the idea of two founding cultures which should have exclusive rights. Philman had many heated debates about this very thing with Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. So I took in about 50 photographs from at random Winnipeg of all sorts of signs throughout St. Boniface, throughout Chinatown, throughout uh, the, the Portuguese area in which there was not a word of English on the sign. And I said, um, this is what our society is going to be in the future. Uh, I said, as a matter of fact, I said, I've done the numbers. And uh, in, in Manitoba today, um, almost 60% of our population is of neither English nor French background. Because we had, I think, 12% uh, indigenous population, and then we had 15% uh, German, 15% Ukrainian, and then on and on and on and on. And I said, so you're building a, a uh, foundation for Canada based on two founding nations uh, being the, the most important element of it, whereas it won't be long now before the entire country uh, as neither uh, English nor French as a 50% uh, of their population. Well, today it's already very close to 60% Canada-wide, I think, if not over 60%. And certainly a problem like ours, just the numbers just keep increasing. Uh, so um, to, to set in stone a definition of Canada based on something that existed a century and a half ago would not make, have made sense. And um, uh, at the time, it was, it was troubling to me. It was hard to explain to a lot of people because they said, well, yeah, but that, you know, that's just Manitoba, you know, when I was telling them. I said, yeah, it is just Manitoba, but look at what's happening in Vancouver, in Toronto, in Montreal, and all these different places in Canada with the influx of people from all over the world. Guess what? Very few of them are coming from, from the British Isles or France. They're coming from Asia. They're coming from uh, the Caribbean, they're coming from all these different places. That's the Canada of the future. And we are trying to build a constitution based on two founding nations, which, th which won't exist for very long. Meech Lake would prove to be a test of personal courage. The civil engineer who started out trying to solve the simplest of community problems now found himself accused of treason and the target of death threats. The only time in basically uh, my 
my life I, uh, in, in politics, I had uh, very, very tight security around me. The RCMP assistant commissioner here in Winnipeg said, I said, look, I don't, I don't want your people hanging around uh, me. And, and he, said, he said, this is my job and my responsibility. And he said, we cannot let you go without having uh, security. So I had, I had uh, the, the, the Pope had just been in, in Canada, I don't know, five years earlier, I, I guess it was. And so I had the, the Pope's personal bodyguard and the driver of the Pope Mobile as my two uh, companions. They said, the, 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 my two RCMP people came to me and said, um, you can't go in the scrum tonight. Uh, we can't guarantee your security. And I said, I'm going in the scrum tonight. And they said, well, we can't, well then we've, we've got to be right beside you. And I said, you're not to be on camera. I'm not going to stand there with, you know, two big hulks uh, standing around me like, you know, I'm somebody who, uh, who needs to have protection. So they said, well, your choice, but, uh, but uh, we, we don't agree with you. So I said, well, that's what's happening. So one of them was in the crowd, um, I don't know, maybe uh, 20 feet away from me, and uh, the other one was somewhere behind me. I don't know where he was, and uh, I went and did the scrum, and everything was okay. But, uh, but that was the kind of atmosphere that was out there. Meech Lake, one of the great political dramas in Canadian history, came to an abrupt end. In Manitoba, uh, Elijah Harper uh, stood up with the eagle feather and refused the unanimous consent to deal with it, and so therefore Meech Lake failed in Manitoba uh, in 1990 in, on June 23rd. Looking back, Gary Philman believes that he restored the confidence of Manitobans in their province and its potential. When I took office in 88, things were uh, pretty negative. Uh, the, 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 they told jokes about uh, Manitobans always uh, going cap in hand, begging in Ottawa and things like that, that uh, we, were, we were referring to ourselves as a have-not province and it grated on me. I absolutely thought that uh, you know we could do better and we should do better and it's time that we found another way. So we spent a lot of time persuading people that uh, we had to do better and that we could do better and we could stand on our own two feet. Part of it had to be, though, getting away from this business of being uh, uh, a, a province that consistently had for 20, almost 20 years by that time run deficits. And uh, uh, so we made a commitment to get out of deficits and we had a very, very difficult time. Uh, but I felt that I was kind of having to operate like, uh, like uh, your, your favorite uncle and, and sit down uh, with the, the, the population and say, look, we have to stand on our own two feet. And you know, deficits are essentially just punting off the, uh, 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 the responsibility to pay the debts to the next generation. Do I want my children and my grandchildren to have to pay for the things that I'm using, the, the money that I'm spending, the decisions that I'm making? No, I don't think so. And I tried to convince the public and believe it, we did have the, the, uh, the support of the public because we went through very, very difficult times and um, they re-elected me twice uh, beyond that to, uh, despite the fact that we made difficult choices at every turn. For all the anxieties, the pressures and frustrations of public life, Gary Philman feels that there was more than enough reward. That, in spite of the fact that he was constantly the lowest paid premier in the country. That doesn't matter. I didn't go into it for, for, uh, for financial rewards. It, it was for the opportunity to do something that, to give back uh, for what Canada has meant to me, what Manitoba has meant to me, and for the opportunity, of course, to, uh, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to do things that I thought were important in, in, in life. And so those were the reasons. He acknowledges that political life in the 21st century seems at a crucially low point in the public eye. 
But he thinks that young people who feel passionately about public service can and must help to redeem it. My own children, uh, um, who I thought might have some interest in, in going into public life, uh, have said, no, Dad, you gave for all of us. And uh, so it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing uh, to, to persuade people that you have to put up with all of this in order, you know, is it worth it in the end, right? Uh, and I think I can, I can tell them that it is worth it because we as a society can only improve and, and uh, uh, make better opportunities for the future if we elect people that we believe in or who have the right attitude towards public service. And uh, as I say, it is a high, higher calling. But uh, in the end, um, there are all these elements out there that just simply criticize uh, and say, and I, mean, I hear it all the time, oh, they're all crooks. I said, wait a sec, that's me. You know, you're talking about, oh, well, well you, we're not talking about you. Yeah, but you are. You can't generalize. Uh, I, th I believe that, I'm, and, and I guess I have a lot easier time these days when I'm not in the hurly-burly and uh, sitting across the, the, uh, the legislature responding to insults or, or allegations or whatever, uh, that I have an easier time saying I believe that everybody who's elected that I ever worked with did it for the right reasons. Yes, we had different views of, of how to accomplish what we felt the world needed, our society needed, our province needed. Yes, we, we, we did uh, have different views and they were very much in contrast at times, but they were in it for the right reasons because they believed that um, uh, the public needed uh, good service and the public needed their skills, their ideas, their talents. Um, and so as long as we have people around who are willing to make the sacrifice, and there are sacrifices there, um, uh, and it, they're not just financial sacrifices, they're your whole time. We live in a goldfish bowl. I said that so many different times to, to my family and to my, my caucus. Um, you know, either live with it or else get out. But if, if you're here, you have to know that you're going to be re responsible to the public every minute of every day, and uh, they're going to call you on anything that they disagree with. So. If you're strong in your views, confident in what, what you stand for, then you'll be able to be okay. Some rewards of a political career last forever. At the Davos Economic Summit of 2000, Gary Filman met Elie Wiesel, honored there as Holocaust survivor and scholar. Asked to describe his greatest fear for the future, Elie Wiesel chose instead to describe his hope. I think the real question we should be asking is what is our greatest hope for the future? Not what, not our greatest fear. And he said, I hope for a world in which teachers will be worthy of their students, in which parents will be worthy of their children, in which leaders will be worthy of their people, and in which friends will be worthy of their friends. It stayed with me, and I've used it from time to time when, when people ask me to sum up something. Uh, and that's what he said. And the place, you could hear a pin drop, and then it went into incredible applause. I mean, but this is, you know, when you're with a person whose thoughts are so big that they can come up with that just spontaneously and even you know stop in the middle of, 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 uh, of a, uh, a question that's taking you all in the wrong direction uh, fears for the next uh, next millennium right no no what are our hopes for the future he turned it on its head and got everybody in the right direction uh, it, w it was brilliant <laughs>